Thank you, thank you. I am of the opinion that one of the ways to best enjoy life is to set your expectations really low, because then everything's very magical. And 100% of you failed to do that just now. Um, I have a lot of things I want to talk to you about. So let's get started. Up here, rhetorical question, what do all of these things have in common? Let me tell you a story. I was up in uh, the San Juan Islands off of Washington State visiting with a mentor friend of mine and some other people who were gathered. And uh, we were having lunch out on this marina in Friday Harbor, uh, if you know what that is. And uh, we were overlooking all of these boats in the marina, you know, marina where boats are parked. And uh, out in front of us, there was this like, uh, there was this zodiac, if you know what that is, like an inflatable raft. There was this like little zodiac. And there was about nine people shoved in on this zodiac, having the time of their life, hooping and hollering, having a great time. And juxtaposed right behind that zodiac was this massive yacht with only one kind of older guy just kind of like piddling around every now and then looking at the zodiac like we were all were doing. And we were sitting uh, with this mentor friend of ours. He's in his late or mid 80s, um, very successful, retired businessman, very smart, very wise. And a group of us were having a conversation. And midway through our conversation, he goes, Hey, do you know how much that boat cost that guy? And uh, I'm a professional artist, I don't know how much yachts cost. So I. We, we were like, uh, mm, I don't know, 500K, a million, $2 million. And he goes, everything. That boat cost that guy everything. You know, these, what these have in common is they're all luxury items. They're all items that you would pur purchase if you happen to be successful, made a lot of money. It's told you should get these things, all right? And they're all luxury items, but what they have in common is not necessarily their price tag. What they have in common is that what makes them infinitely more enjoyable is if somebody else is there enjoying it with you. Like a friend. Like a friend. Because I think actually what we really, really want is friendship. With our success, what we really want is friendship. It's not the house or the car or the vacation, right? Because you can have a great big house, but it doesn't mean that it's a home. You can have a great big car, but it doesn't mean you have anywhere else to go. You can go on the fanciest vacations, but if you have nobody to talk about, I don't know, did it really happen? If a once-in-a-lifetime vacation falls in the woods and nobody sees it, does it really make a sound, right? Right? Friends. Friends are what make life interesting. I think friendship is one of the greatest things we've ever been given. In fact, I think friendship is one of the greatest things you will ever be given in your life. Like, what, what is a friend, right? Now, I mean, a lot of us have different definitions for friends. And friends could be, like, something we have in common with or somebody we knew from school. Or for a lot of us, apparently bouncers are all of our friends because they're always like, friend, friend, come here, friend, come over here, friend, right? But I would say like a friend is someone that you're experiencing, observing, participating, and contemplating being alive with. It's a friend is like someone who helps illuminate what living is. When something happens to you, something devastating or something joyful, you immediately like, I got to call somebody. I got to talk to my friend. I got to tell them. Friendship is the lantern of life. Friendship is the lantern of life. In fact, at the end of life, it's been recorded by most hospice care workers that the most common regret before people die, one of them is, I wish I would have stayed in touch with my friends. One of the most val valuable things in living was having friendships. I'm a big fan of friends. In fact, on my website, uh, in my store, the secret promo code that gets you a big discount is Friends Forever, which is quoting the 1987 smash hit Friends by Michael W. Smith. And if you know this song, Smitty, in that song, he said, friends are friends forever if, anybody know this? The Lord's the Lord of them, which is a pretty interesting American evangelical claim that the afterlife Heaven is a place where all your friends will be, and, and apparently hell will be the place where it's just you and everybody on your next door app, okay? Um, in, fact, in fact, even Jesus talked about friendship. He moved his disciples from followers to friendship. He even said, hey, the best thing, the greatest love in the world is when one lays their life down for their friends, which is interesting because in order to lay your life down, it presupposes you actually have friends to do that with. Like, existence is based on relationship. Like the universe is a relational place. Now I know this is Plywood Presents and I know we're supposed to be talking about 
business and, oh, there, I had that slide, I forgot about that. <laughs> we know we're supposed to be talking about business and, you know, entrepreneurship and all this stuff. And, and we will. But I actually think that friendship ties in a lot to the work or the work that we're trying to do in the world. I know it because often we've come across this statement. It's lonely at the top. It's lonely at the top, which again presupposes that what we're supposed to find there is friendship. And I'm not talking about the dynamics of like starting a business and, you know, having a, a, a bunch of people who work for you and, and having that kind of, I'm not talking about that dynamic. I understand that if you're a leader and you lead other people, there's a certain amount of kind of like separateness that is involved with leadership. But I am saying that, is, is it a surprise to us that after all our hard work and hustle, that what we would find when we reached our greatest goals is that we were alone? Which may be because internally what we're saying was like, I thought I was doing all of this so I could be known. I thought I was doing all of this so I could be loved. And I would like to propose to you that friendship is nothing you'll ever find at the top. But friendship is something that you can bring to the top. And in fact, fostering friendships in your life with other people is going to inform the top more than anything else. In fact, it might even change what you think the top is. I make my living as a visual artist and a spiritual director and just all around artsy fartsy kind of guy. So I like to make images and, I'm, and there's like three images I kind of want us to use to contemplate what friendship could mean and how it involves with our friendship with our work. I actually think that we have three friendships in our lives. We have friendship with ourselves, sorry, friendship with others, friendship with ourselves, and friendships with our work. And I actually think friendship with others really informs the friendship with ourselves and our friendship with our work. And I want to look about how friendship informs our friendship with our work. This is not the image, but I'll just tell you, a lot of this came about because I started reading these articles by writer Julie Beck on The Atlantic. For the last couple of years, she's been interviewing people about their friendships, and she started this thing called The Friendship Files. And uh, it's worthy of an Atlantic subscription. <laughs> uh, they're really fantastic. There was one article that really caught my attention lately, and it was about five stay-at-home dads that have become best friends. Now, they all live in Kansas City. And look... I know we're all open to the different kinds of people who will stay at home and take kids here and stuff. But I do think that often, like for their experience, they're like being a stay-at-home dad and full-time caretaker is a little off-putting for some people. Like they all mentioned they get weird looks at the playground. You know, they never get invited to play dates and stuff like that. So they happen to be like on some kind of meetup and they all, a few of them met. And they exchanged some numbers like maybe it'd be fun to hang out sometime. One of them went on an adventure. Another one found out about it and said, why didn't you call me? I want to go. So the next week they went and then some other people found out about it. And they started doing these weekly adventures because they're like, just because we're stay-at-home dads doesn't mean we have to stay at home. We can take our kids. We can go on adventures. And as they started doing these things together, it started to foster this deep friendship through the highs and the lows of parenting, through difficult times and great times. Their kids became friends. Their wives became friends. And now they spend a good, like, every weekend together, kind of fostering this deep relationship. And one of the things that they said uh, that was really interesting is that Julie was like, so what do you think about the nuclear family? And one of them said, you know, the nuclear family is a great idea, like two parents and 2.5 kids or whatever. But actually what we found to be better is a network of people that were doing it together. Because there are times when something happens to you and you need others to help you out. And these guys have been able to come and take care of my kids and take care of the things in my family when I couldn't do it. And they fostered this kind of deep and meaningful relationship. Here is a lie that I have often believed about friendship. When I finally become a shiny and delightful thing, people will want to be friends with me. When I finally become somebody attractive or successful or something that people want to be around, then I'll finally get the friendship that I want. And the, it, another way to say it is it's lonely at the top. Because friendship is never really forged in power Friendship is always formed in vulnerability. Vulnerability. Vulnerability is not necessarily your weaknesses or limitations. As much as vulnerability is the way you feel about your relationship with your weaknesses and limitations. How do you feel about having weaknesses and limitations? Is it something you're ashamed of? Is it something that you hide away? Or I think the work and the transformation is to realize it becomes the way in which you connect with other people. 
Like these dads didn't become friends because they were all killing their homeschooling and stay-at-home dad game. No, they became friends because they eventually all reached the end of their capacity on being able to do it by themselves. And in the end of that capacity, they found one another. And this is true of all human relationships. Like, you can only go so long with trophy-telling stories before it becomes really boring, right? It's only in that moment as you're, as you're building a friendship that somebody goes, hey, this is when I got hurt. Hey, this is when I failed at something. Hey, this is something I'm afraid of. This is when I got wounded. And in that vulnerability, a connection is started. A connection is formed. This is why, like, the idea that friendship is formed in power is a lie. And this is why celebrities make awful friends. Do any of you have celebrity as friends? They're trash friends. You know this to be true. Because usually that dynamic is, is, is built on power. It's built on some kind of power dynamic, and it never works in real friendship. This is all faith traditions have these stories. Like the tradition I grew up in, it's the prodigal son, right? What's that story? This guy gets a lot of money, and then it's like, party, 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 until the money runs out. And then every Everybody's gone and they're all alone, right? This is why celebrities only, always their best friends are their bodyguards. Because they can't make friendships based on power. They only make it based on vulnerability. Now, how does this, uh, because like there's only certain things you can do with your friends. And it's a way of practicing vulnerability. Like you can TP a house with strangers, but really you're all in it to win it together, right? But you can, <laughs> and you can only really say I'm sorry and mean it if it's something that you're a friend with, if you're being vulnerable with. And there's lots of other things there too. Being in a friendship, being <laughs> practicing friendship is the practice of vulnerability. It's the practice of connection and vulnerability. There you go. There's some funny things in there. You'll get it. So how does this tie in with our relationship with our work? I'm guessing that maybe some of you have been void of this, and so, great. Um, please polish your metal at this moment. But there's a lot of us here who've gone through some kind of a death of a dream. I'm sure there's a bunch of us here who thought we were headed towards somewhere, put a lot of effort into something, and it didn't work out. And we had this dream, and it died. And that's a very real thing that a lot of us went through. But I'd like to submit to you that why the dream died is because a dream was a version of yourself that didn't have any weaknesses or limitations. When you imagined a dream job, a dream scenario, a dream thing working out, you never imagined that you would be in that situation with your weaknesses and, <laughs> and limitations in that scenario. Starting your dream business, you never imagined the vulnerable relationship with somebody who's fronting the capital, and that's always a little weird. <laughs> like, starting, uh, you know, your business and getting into it, you never imagined that maybe you would have a kid who had an ailment, and it caused you to have this vulnerable relationship to what you're doing. The dream of our work life will always die because that dream is false. And what we're being offered is an invitation into something that we haven't seen yet, which is us moving forward in our vulnerabilities. And I'd like to submit to you that your vulnerabilities, just as you connect with other people through that, your work, the way you connect with your work, and how your work connects with other people will be through those vulnerabilities. It's not your power. It's the way you connect. It is the tired moms who still love really good meals, who decided to, you know, work hard on, hard on a food recipe website and then eventually led to a cookbook and all those things because they're like, hey, just because we're moms doesn't mean we have to not eat good food. It is the, like, real estate agent who knows what it's like to be poor, who ends up making a successful business and goes, you know what? How are people buying houses? Where are people living? Is this the way that we should do it? Maybe some things are wrong. I'd like to help change that. I am the visual artist who has a son who's gone through multiple eye surgeries this summer and is maybe possibly losing his eyesight. And I think a lot about what does it mean to see in the world that is full of misunderstanding. It is the places that we are not in control or limited or weakened that affect the way that we approach our work. It's not about your power. It's about your connection. Secondly, I had a pandemic best friend. This is a picture of my friend Britt. My wife and I and our family moved to Austin, Texas from Portland, Oregon at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, both cities trying to keep it weird. And we, uh, we knew some people there, but we pretty much had to start over relationally. And it was a weird time because the pandemic, the kind of the vibe was like, don't talk to people. They're bad. You'll get sick. You'll die. You know what I'm saying? And... Um, 
But I, uh, I kind of knew Britt from Instagram, and we both, like, endorsed each other's books, but we'd never met in public or in person. And so she moved to town with her spouse, and I just, at a time that it was safe, I was like, hey, you want to get some coffee? And we ended up getting together for coffee, and we had a great time. We found out that we had a lot in common, a lot different. We were both interested in the, in the cross-section of spirituality and uh, comedy, and we had a lot of things to talk about. So we said, you know, why don't we do it next week, and then the next week. And we started just getting together every week. We'd spend long hours together, talk about the things we were interested in, talk about our lives. Our spouses ended up hanging out. They be, she was like my best friend. During the pandemic, Britt was my best friend. And then after a year of living in Austin, her and her spouse were like, we're out of here. Um, and they decided to move back to LA. And we're still friends and we still talk and we're still planning things together. But I miss my pandemic best friend. I miss being in proximity to Britt. And I, and I think there's a thing here, which is like, when we talk about friendship, we're also talking about loneliness and the lack of friendship. This is a painting by Claude Monet called Ship at Low Tide at Facamp. And um, when you were to look at this impressionistic painting, you would see that here's this like massive ship just stuck in the mud. They're just leaning over, people walking around. And the impression, this is during the impressionist time, the impression is like, this ship ain't going anywhere. Look at this ship. It's kind of not doing its business. It's kind of a failure. Look at it. It's just stuck right there. I think one of the things that when we think about our history of friendship and our friends and friendship is that we'll have seasons where we're like, man, back then I was really connected. But then we'll also have seasons where we're like, I don't really know if I'm connecting with anybody right now. I actually feel like I'm pretty lonely. And I think if we could be in control of all of that, what we'd want to do is go back to where we had our best friends and we would just want to hold that in place and stop time and keep it there. But that's not how reality works. And when we look at this painting, maybe we could give grace to ourselves that actually, because what's happening in this painting, it looks like the ship is a big failure, but if you were to come back just 12 hours later, the water of the tide would have moved back in and that ship would be ready to go. We can never stop what is happening. Things are always changing. Even if we're not really paying attention, they're always changing. I've moved quite a few times as an adult, and I've had to go to new cities and start friendships as an adult. Have you ever tried to do that? It's really freaking hard, all right? Because adults have this history of relationships that they've already built, and they only have this, like, little tiny sliver of time for new people. And, right, and if you're going to get time for new people, you got to make that time magical. Now, because I've moved a lot and had to build new friendships, I've come up with some activities to do. You know, there's sort of traditional, like, coffee and food and things like that, but you could do some more exciting things like an art museum or, you know, go to maybe here or um, a walk. Look, I'm a man in my mid-40s. Every day all I want to do is go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. You want to hang out? Let's go for a walk. It's all about walks. But if you were to go on a walk together and try to build something, you would, you would work through the first formal questions. How are you? What do you do? All these kinds of things. And then you'd be like, what else do we talk about? And actually, I think a key to building friendship is thinking through the questions you want to ask people. It's best to ask people, <laughs> don't ask questions that are yes or no questions. Ask questions that have to make a response. Get deeper to things, right? And there's a different way you can phrase things. I actually have a note in my phone when I'm going to go into social situations and I don't want to blow it. I'm like, what are questions I want to ask tonight at this party? I looked at it before the party that I just went to, right? Like, it's helpful to prep yourself with these questions. And these are some of my favorite ones. Like, what lights you up? What's your hidden talent? If you could be a character in any movie, who would you be? I like the last one. What animal would you be the cutest if you scaled it down to the size of a cat? Oh, man, the answers are fantastic, right? It's helpful to know these questions because what makes a good friendship is just two things. It's intentionality and, uh, and time. It's really those two things. It's time that you're together and the intentionality of getting to know one another, doing things together, doing fun things together, building those relationships together. How does this apply? How does this add to our work, our relationship with our work? Well, just like that painting, there's only a few slides back. Um, just like that painting, I think that we've all maybe had this experience, or if you're young, get ready, you're going to have this experience, where there are times when your work is killing it. Oh, man, I came up with this thing. I came up with these Instagram posts. I came up with this product. I came up with this business plan, and it is the bee's knees right now. It is in the zeitgeist. Everybody's talking about it. And then, like, two years later, you're like, nobody's talking about it anymore. Oh, no, they started a new social platform. I'm not ready to pivot over to videos of myself doing 
this? Oh my gosh! How am I supposed to do that? Oh no, a new technology came out. Everything that we came up with is void now. How are we supposed to do it? Just like in friendship when we want to stop things, I think there's this relationship with our work, which is like, tell me how to do it for the rest of my life and push pause. I don't want to adapt to change. I don't want to have to do anything different. I just want it to stay this way forever because life is exhausting. You're exhausted. We're all exhausted. And having to adapt is, I'll just say it. I'll say fuck first. It's fucking exhausting. I know I won't be invited back, and that's fine. I, no, it's not because of that. It's just because why would you want this again? Um, And there might have been times when what you were doing was really awesome, and then you find yourself, you're going to be like, man, it stopped working. And when you look at that ship, are you like, it's over? Is it done? Do I need to move on? But you know what? Just like in 12 hours later, that water will come back. Things will also change. Things being over don't stay that way either. And I guess what we could do with the time where things aren't working out is maybe bring what we can bring to friendship, which is time and intentionality. How could we spend time with our work? What are the questions that we could ask about our work? Like, why did I start doing that? What lights me up? What is my talent? What have I been doing? If I could get uh, in touch with a part of myself that I've lost touch with, what do I want to get in a part of my work? What did I love about my work? And I lost touch with that. How can I reconnect with that? What are the questions that you're asking to the change that's happening in the relationship with your work. And then lastly, um, this one. I have, a, I have a relationship. This one's a little odd, but I have a relationship with uh, my friend's dog. Now, uh, I'm a cat person. I have two cats. I love them. I like cats more than dogs because I don't have time for more existential questions. Because cats are like, we got it. We're self-motivated. We sleep all day. That's our favorite entertainment. Dogs come up to you and they're like, can you tell me the meaning of life because I don't know what to do today. And I'm like, scram. I'm asking that same question. I don't have time for you. Right? But I know some people like to be codependent, so that's why you like dogs. It's great. It's fine. We have a place for all of us. But I go over to my friend's house, and I'm building a relation with, with his dog, and she's delightful. And we'll play catch and do all this stuff. And then she'll come back, and she'll be completely exhausted. And what she will do is she will roll over on her chest, and she will expose her belly for me to rub and pet, which completely slays me every time. It slays me because I don't know if she knows, but it's a bit terrorizing to keep yourself open to the world to keep yourself open from being hurt. Like, she doesn't know it, but, like, you know, to keep yourself open means that you could be hurt, you could be touched, you could possibly be betrayed. Or in this situation, your bowels could be opened up and spilled out on the nice rug, right? But she does it, and it calls in that same invitation for me. You know, even like Jesus got betrayed by a friend, so if we think that we're going to engage with friendship and be set apart from the sacred art of friending, we're lying to ourselves. I know we've all been hurt here. I know we've all been betrayed in some ways. And you want to close off. You want to stop showing your belly, offering yourself. But can I also say that all of my best friends that I have now, that I've been in long-term relationships, we've all failed each other. We've all hurt each other. We've all let each other down. And what is past betrayal is conversation and kindness and confession and repentance and grace and empathy and reconstruction and reconciliation. And I wouldn't know any of those if I was only committed to the outcomes of friendship that I wanted to be in control of. What I am committed to is the process of friendship and what comes out about that. I think this ties into our work in this way. We're all invited to be a contribution. And sometimes that contribution might not land the way that you want it to. And what you want to do is you want to be like, no, I didn't. I'm done. I'm done. It didn't work out. I'm done. And living a life not being a contribution anymore is a sad life. And you know it. But it hurts to open up. But I wonder if we could do, as we practice this work, what's beyond betrayal, what's beyond disappointment, maybe we could do that with our work. 
maybe we can, instead of trying to be in control of what contribution is going to do, maybe we can be committed to contribution and see what it's going to do. Because I think a lot of times when, juggler, I think a lot of times when we imagine the top, we imagine a place where I could be in control finally. And there's an interesting thing, the fruit of being in control. But if we could be dedicated to the commitment to be a contribution, that opens us up to so many other things. That opens us up to being like not static, but adapting, not holding, but giving, not being a dick, but being a gift. There's wonderful things about being committed to the process, the commitment of being a contribution than there is trying to control what contribution is going to look like. My time is over, and I went a little over, but thank you. Uh, I know we're going to have some great speakers this evening, and tomorrow we're going to talk about all the wonderful things and stuff. But I just wanted to take a time to talk about what does it mean to be a human and to do work? What does it mean to be a friend and to try something in the world? Because I know that what... Um, I just really don't think that, like, you're ever going to find what you're looking for in your success. But I think you can find what you're looking for and bring that to your success. Thank you. Have a good night.